Hello, and welcome to our next installment of our Kentucky 4-H Civic Engagement Discussion Series. Today, we are at the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, and we are going to be speaking with Kentucky Commissioner of Agriculture, Dr. Ryan Quarles. Dr. Quarles is such a big supporter of the Kentucky 4-H program, but also a huge supporter of the importance of civic engagement of youth and adults. We look forward to hearing what he and Kentucky 4-H Treasurer Kirsten Dotson have to say. So Commissioner Quarles, um, if you don't care, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, are you originally from Kentucky? Just anything you want to share in general? Yes, well I grew up on a family farm like countless other Kentuckians and my family actually moved here in the 1780s. So I'm ninth generation Kentucky farm boy from Scott County, grew up on a tobacco and cattle operation. And one of the very first things that I was introduced to was Kentucky 4-H. I have an older brother, my dad was active in 4-H. And so for us, uh, I was really blessed to grow up in a family that not only farmed in Central Kentucky, but also valued uh, the leadership skills and development that Kentucky 4-H has to offer. Do you care to please tell us a little bit about the main purpose of the Office of the Commissioner of Ag Kentucky? Kind of what's your role in each of them? Well, the number one objective for the, any Commissioner of Agriculture is to promote Kentucky agriculture. And that means many different things. And here at the KDA, we have over 100 different programs that we run that help benefit not just our farmers, but the agriculture community and all consumers. And just a few of these would include Kentucky Proud, which is a highly visible program, very successful. We help assist our farmers markets, uh, over 70 county fairs, plus we help run the Kentucky State Fair along with UK and KSU Extension and our fairground employees. We also have oversight over rare plants like ginseng. We also run a, uh, a health and safety program, primarily revolving around mental health, but also equipment safety as well. Uh, we also help our livestock markets out. We oversee all, uh, almost 30 livestock markets in Kentucky, and the list goes on and on. And then there's the Office of State Veterinarian. I just talked about Office of Marketing. The State Vet, underneath the leadership of Dr. Katie Flynn, the first female state veterinarian in our Kentucky history, we have oversight over every animal disease in Kentucky, except for those that involve pets. And so these things called coronaviruses, we've been dealing with those for decades in Kentucky. And there's a lot, lot of uh, misunderstood but important objectives for the Office of State Veterinarian. And then one of the most interesting things that the KDA does that a lot of consumers don't know about is our regulatory side. In fact, over half of my employees are dedicated to things that most people would not connect with agriculture. These are things like weights and measures, gas pumps, when you check out at the grocery store. That's the Kentucky Department of Ag making sure that consumers get what they're actually purchasing. So I like to remind folks that if you were to weigh your truck on the side of the interstate, if you were to sell gold at a pawn store, if you were to buy a bag of mulch, if you were to rent a backyard inflatable for your birthday party, ride a Ferris wheel or go down a zip line or fly out of any Kentucky airport, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture plays a consumer protection role. And then lastly, we are a constituent-based uh, government agency, meaning if a farmer or agribusiness has an issue, whether it's state government or things going on in Washington, D.C., we expect them to call our office and we're gonna get an answer for those folks. And so. That's kind of the, the nine to five version, but it's a full-time job. But one of my favorite things to do is interact with our, with our youth, and that includes Kentucky 4-H. Well, say you do sound like a very busy man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you juggle it all. Just put gray hair on my head. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been very active in the support of agriculture education at all levels. Um, do you care to explain kind of your thoughts about the future of ag for the 4-Hers that are currently watching? Well, number one, you cannot pick a better organization to get involved in than Kentucky 4-H, especially at that critical age from middle school on, and, and including our elementary schools as well. You combine that with Kentucky FFA, those are two very powerful programs. But for me, I would not be where I'm at today if it had not been for my Kentucky 4-H and FFA experience. My first speech was in 4-H. I was so nervous. I didn't do very well. But practice makes perfect. Uh, also, my first trip to Washington, D.C., was with Kentucky 4-H, so it really opened my eyes to public service and choosing a career where you give back to others. And so my message to Kentucky 4-Hers is get involved. There's so many great programs that you can find at all different levels. 
you're going to become a better person. And the leadership styles and development that you have at your age are lessons that will last a lifetime, whether it be soft skills, learning how to communicate and interact, or things like record keeping, or even starting your own business with Kentucky 4-H. Those are the things that will last a lifetime. And looking towards the future, we need you. We need you in Kentucky. That agriculture in our state in general needs uh, smart, intelligent, motivated uh, individuals like yourself to tar- carry our state into the next uh, to the next level. And that just doesn't include agriculture jobs, but it includes all sorts of jobs uh, across the spectrum, whether it be manufacturing, uh, higher education, legal, uh, biotech. The 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 sky is the limit. And I'm just so fortunate that Kentucky 4-H is the largest youth development organization in Kentucky, and it's there for a reason. It's there to help better the future of our state. What are some of the positions in your office, um, and what are their different kind of duties? We have a little bit of everything. I kind of like to refer to ourselves as the islands, the island of misfits, because there's a lot of things that happen here that, again, you wouldn't associate with the KDA. And we'll just kind of start with my office. The the Ag Commissioner, we're expected to be very uh, publicly visible, responsive to issues, and be a promoter for uh, everything under the sun. And then you have some really specialized positions here. I mentioned our state veterinarian, a very specific role, whether it be cattle, poultry, or high-valued thoroughbreds, those all fall underneath the jurisdiction of the KDA. Another interesting position is that we employ the state beekeeper. Uh, which is kind of a highly coveted position in our state. I think we have 8,000 beekeepers in our state, and we have one of the best uh, state apiarists uh, in the nation. And that's one of those that you kind of say, wow, this is something really unique. We have a venture culturalist here at the KDA that helps out with wine production and grape production as well. And then you have uh, some specialists where we don't duplicate what UK and KSU Extension does. We help a system. So we actually have some folks that help with beef marketing. Uh, plant production, et cetera. And uh, another uh, cadre of positions we have, we have a full-blown press team. There's a lot of publications. There's over 80 agriculture organizations in Kentucky, and we have to interact with each and every one of those. Uh, we actually have a, a farm safety director. Uh, Dale Dobson is known all across Kentucky for the work that he does. And for what, every one of those positions, there's another five or half dozen that are just unique that, are, that span across the KDA campus. And so for me, it's just a pleasure as commissioner to work with these people. Uh, I'm not necessarily their boss. I'm necessarily their cheerleader, help them, give them the tools they need to succeed out in the field. Sounds like you have a very wide variety of different jobs here. I'm I'm still learning (laughs) some of it. So um, do you hear you as a little bit of information about your educational background? Um, What kind of educational degrees or certifications are actually needed for this position in general? Well, the Constitution uh, requires you to be at least 30 years old and be a resident of the state for six years. Now, I think the ag community would prefer something a little bit beyond that. And I think the best education I had was growing up on a farm uh, that I spent my childhood uh, working in tobacco and cattle and corn, wheat, and soybeans. But my formal education uh, went to Scott County High School, and I was so fortunate to choose UK College of Ag to study. I uh, picked up uh, three undergraduate uh, majors and two graduate degrees in four years there. And so I had a major in ag economics, public service and leadership, and another major in political science. And then I picked up a master's in agriculture economics while I was at UK, as well as a master's in international trade and commerce from the Patterson School of Diplomacy. And then I felt that wasn't enough. And I went on to UK law school uh, where I somewhat somewhat specialized in in ag law. Um, And then I took a year off from that, got a master's from Harvard University in higher education administration, came back, finished my law degree, ran for office, uh, served five years in the legislature, and I was really fortunate to have a dad that was a farmer who was involved in the community, but I had a public school teacher mom, and she taught for nearly 30 years. And she went on later in life as a non-traditional student to get her PhD at UK. And in honor of her memory, I went and got my PhD as well, my doctorate, that is, down at Vanderbilt in higher education. And so some say I'm a glutton for punishment. I have seven college degrees. But for me, uh, it's about how you apply that 
And, and I really think that education is a lifelong activity. It's not something you just end once you graduate college or high school. It's something you have to continuously improve upon uh, every single year uh, so that you can put the best, uh, best foot forward. And as, I, as, as Ag Commissioner, I try to apply that education, uh, particularly in Washington, D.C., and higher level things like trade talks, et cetera, that, that I'm really fortunate. And I really think that education is the great equalizer in life, that you can, as long as you work hard, you're dedicated, you can become just about anything you want in the United States of America, and it starts with education. I will say being a first year college student, I am very impressed by all the <laughs> education that you have because it is tough. <laughs> well, my mom told me, she said you can either work in tobacco or study. So it was like a, it was a motivator for me, right? That is fair. So one of our 4 h actually noticed that the Office of Commissioner of Agriculture is a constitutional yeah. position. Um, how have you seen that position change throughout your uh, tenure? Yeah, so I'm one of nine people who are elected statewide, and seven of us are prescribed in the Kentucky Constitution, the 1891 most recent version. So I'm right there with the governor, attorney general, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, the treasurer, uh, auditor, uh, and, and myself. And so for me, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a very respected office, especially in a state that's dominated by agriculture. And my job application is, is a little unique for other compared to other people that I have to go out and and actually run for office. There's 4.5 million Kentuckians. That means I have 4.5 million bosses. Uh, not all of them are happy with me at the same time, but that's part of the political process. There's only 12 states where the commissioners are elected, and for me, I take uh, I take that very seriously. That I work for all Kentuckians. It doesn't matter if it's rural, urban, Democrat or Republican or anything in between, that, that I work for everybody, even folks that we may have a disagreement with every once in a while. And so during my now two terms, I think what we've seen is that the visibility of the office, I would hope, has grown. I think that we've elevated the importance of the office as well, that we're not just about cows, plows, and sows, that we're about economic development. We're about creating jobs. We're about being a voice, particularly for say rural healthcare issues or broadband internet or vice versa in, in areas like Louisville, there's a food desert there. And so I hope that people look at us more than just production agriculture, that they look at us as an entity that helps create jobs and helps make Kentucky a better place to live. What experience have you had in, in the Kentucky 4-H program and what have those experiences kind of taught you? I was one of those 4-Hers that got involved in just about every program possible. I was so fortunate that I had extension agents that cared, that really wanted to push you and let you explore your interests. And so for me, it was state tractor driving competitions. It was all the different uh, entries at our county fair, earning a trip to Washington, D.C., uh, as well as uh, programs that were fresh at the time, the 4 sh shooting sports, just got it started when I was young and there, and actually won two state titles shooting, but I wouldn't be able to win them today because it's so competitive now. And those are the sorts of memories I have. And of course, 4-H camp was amazing. And I truly cherish those memories as a JC going back. And of course, uh, state team council. I think that to this day, there's probably at least a dozen people I served with on STC that I still keep in pretty good touch with. And some of them I work with uh, here in Frankfurt or across the state. And so for me, I think the most fond memory I had in Kentucky 4-H was following in my dad's footsteps and winning the state tractor driving competition. It's really the only thing I brag about around here uh, because my dad won it in the 1960s. I think one or two of his brothers won. We've had lots of cousins win this thing. And my older brother never won the 4-H tractor driving competition. So I like to remind him about that as often as possible. And we still do that today at the Kentucky State Fair. It's really tough. And when I describe the competition to people that may not be familiar with it, they may be scratching their heads saying, what is this? But it's one of the more fun ones. And it's something that my family truly has a tradition in. It definitely sounds like 4-H is a family thing <laughs> that runs in your family. It is. <laughs> So what would you say um, to the 4 hers in Kentucky about the importance of civic engagement and service? Um, just kind of like what you would like to see them do. The number one piece of advice I would have is get involved. Stay informed. 
start reading the news, pay attention about what's going on in your county, in your city, what's going on in Frankfurt, Washington, D.C., and we're truly a global society now. Start learning about how we fit into this really complex and interconnected world because the jobs of the future uh, oftentimes are going to be in part of that global economy. The second piece of advice I would have is explore what 4-H has to offer, particularly when it comes to civics, that it's a great supplement from what you hear learn, learn about in your history or social studies class, that you actually get to live it. You get the opportunity to serve as an officer or run for uh, a, an office in one of your 4-H clubs. Uh, the concept of, of community-oriented leadership and taking care of your neighbors, those are things that were instilled in me at a young age that when we're trying to uh, address very complex issues in modern agriculture, it's oftentimes those civics lessons that I learned growing up as a clover bud that really shine through. And then the last piece of advice I would have to say is as you conclude your 4-H experience, don't let that be your last 4-H experience. 4-H is based off volunteers and people who care and donors as well. And so if you can't, you know, later in life, if you can't donate money, if you can't donate supplies, consider donating time because chances are there was some parent or some counselor or some extension agent that took a chance on you when you were a young kid. They certainly did for me. And so I think it's uh, one of those lifelong giving opportunities for you to give back to an organization that touches so many people's lives. And one of the biggest attributes that I can contribute to Kentucky 4-H is giving kids of all backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic, rural versus urban, giving kids some confidence. That a lot of times in Kentucky, you know, we look at where we, where we stand in some of these rankings, and sometimes we rank at the bottom of things, we should be ranking at the top end and vice versa. 4-H instills confidence that yes, I can accomplish things. I can learn uh, about running a business. I can learn about being civically involved, et cetera. And that's something that just can't be given to someone. It has to be earned. And so please consider making the most of your 4-H experience while you're in it. And then sometime later in life, giving back to the organization. So are there any questions about the Kentucky 4-H program that you would like to ask? Oh, where do we start? Uh, <laughs> how many members do you have now? Oh, goodness. There is a lot. Like... It's well over 200,000, I think, well yeah. 200,000, I believe. That's the stat I like to give oh, people, yeah. is just the footprint of the program is so massive. It is. And uh, the other thing is, is, why don't you tell us about the ham project? See, that didn't, that didn't, that didn't exist when I was growing up. So, um, where I'm from Pike County, you know, we don't really have um, the ham project. But being at the State Fair this year, 4-H'ers um, from <laughs> all over the state of Kentucky yeah. worked all year to cure this ham. And I like to say, whenever um, I was talking to my fellow officer, Emma, she was like, we start out with the green ham. And I was like, wait a minute, the ham is green? She's like, no, 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 you just have to cure it. Yeah. And so, it was just something, um, for my experience, at the state fair, you know, that was one day the 4-H'ers brought all their hams and we took the hams and we put over like 800 hams on yeah. this table and they were judged. And so like the top ham sold this year, I believe, to Kentucky Farm Bureau for thousands of dollars. It's crazy <laughs> to see all their hard work yeah. um, pay off throughout the whole entire year of something that some 4-H'ers might not know about and something that hundreds know about. I think that's the key is that the ham project, like so many other 4-H programs, even if you don't live on a farm, even if you don't have a hog to cure, 4-H allows you to do things that otherwise may not exist in your home county. I think it's one of the cool things about that program. What's your favorite 4-H program? <laughs> Um, for me, mine was poultry judging. Okay. Um, so even though we didn't have chickens to judge in Pike County, we made a trip to McGoffin County yeah. um, and did different trainings with Dr. Pascatori and yep. Dr. Jacobs, um, just about how to judge these chickens and give speeches on the chickens, the different qualities of the eggs, the chicken carcasses, different <laughs> a bunch of different like bird carcasses that you judge. And you know, whenever I first started, I was like, oh, I'm gonna hate this. I was like, this is not gonna yeah. be fun. This is not gonna be enjoyable. But I ended up going to nationals in it and one no first way. in the state. And it was just a really good program to that if I wouldn't have been pushed by my agents or my family to kind of step out of my comfort zone, then it's something I would have never done and never enjoy as much as I do. See, those, that's the sort of stories I like to hear is, is something that 
that prior to joining 4-H, you would have never guessed never you'd have like gotten into this. And there's so many um, young Kentuckians that I've met that now turned what may be an obscure hobby into something they're really proficient at. And that's what I like to hear about and see. And one of the things that always impresses me is, is hearing uh, 4-Hers give speeches. Just giving speeches off the top of your head and giving greetings. And so whenever I see a green jacket, I, I know I can always call on a, a state 4-H officer to give a, a welcome, and it's always going to come off great. That's the one thing that I love to see is when I started out in the speech program, I was a nervous wreck. Like, yeah. I probably could have not even sat in front of you and talked to you, <laughs> like kind of a nervous wreck. But it was just great to see not only my progress, but yep. the other 4 H's progress that I kind of went through the program with as well, from where we started out to kind of where we are now with it. And that's the sort of confidence I was talking about, is you get better, you get better at practice. You want to do the pledge together? <laughs> we can. <laughs> All right. You ready? I'm ready. All right. I pledge my head, head to, to clear thinking, thinking my, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health for better thing. living. For my, my club, my community, my country, my country and my world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you don't have anything else for me, we actually would like to give you oh, this pen. Oh, heck yeah. Um, just to kind of remember the Kentucky 4-H program and all the 4-Hers within the program I appreciate as well. that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow. Wasn't that a wonderful discussion? Two things that I really got involved with in the discussion was when Dr. Quarles mentioned the importance of young people getting involved and staying informed. And that's what we do in Kentucky 4-H. And we are glad that you were here and watched this wonderful discussion. We want to thank Dr. Quarles for being with us today and allowing us to uh, take part in this discussion during his very busy schedule. We want to thank our own uh, University of Kentucky College of Agriculture Communications for their wonderful job in videoing and editing. And of course, a thank you to Kirsten Dotson, Kentucky 4-H Treasurer. And thank you for joining us in this series for civic engagement. <laughs> <laughs>